Are you an adventurer looking to take your hunt to the next level? Then you're in the right place. Welcome to East Meets West Hunt with your host, Bo Martonic. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the East Meets West Hunt podcast presented by Spartan Forge. On today's episode, I am joined by tournament archer and accomplished hunter Chris B. So Chris is well known for his YouTube channel and his brand Be Real. So we discuss him getting into tournament archery, solo filming hunts, making a living off of YouTube, some of his favorite DIY whitetail hunts, and then dive a little bit more into the archery side of things. Some things that we look at as, you know, mistakes bow hunters make getting ready for the season, including anchor points, broadhead tuning, heavy arrows, and just overall getting comfortable with your setup. On this week's Mountain Buck Monday Story of the Week, this one comes from Brad Van Aken out of the Catskill and Adirondack Mountains up in New York. And Brad wrote, The hunt started at 4 a.m. on Friday, October 30th. My dad and I headed to a mountain range in the Adirondacks, one we had hunted together for over 10 years. We parked on two opposite sides of the 5,000-acre mountain range with a plan to push to the top of the mountain towards each other. We couldn't find a fresh buck track with tracking, so at three-quarter mile up the mountain, there was about an inch and a half of fresh snow, and I found several doe tracks feeding. I then looped around the back side of the mountain, where I found a small buck track that was making scrapes on the fresh snow. I tracked him for about a mile before I left his track to head towards two high knobs that overlook three ponds. I have found great sign on those points in the past. I didn't see the sign that I wanted. So it was 1230 and I had already covered almost five miles. So I decided to head towards an area of the mountain that I had never hunted before. On top of an open oak ridge, I found what I was looking for, which is good buck rubs and scrapes. And I then suddenly heard something running directly behind me. I thought it was a doe or maybe it was a bear. I then turned to find a buck's rack heading directly towards me. I pulled up my rifle and the buck stopped at about 20 yards and his vitals were behind a four inch ironwood. I took the quick shot and the deer ran across the top of the ridge where I took one more quick shot at him and he jumped off the side of the rock ledge. So when I looked for blood, I saw that I had shot through the ironwood tree, and, but there was you know, a bunch of hair and some blood. I tracked the blood to the edge of the cliff. Looking down, he walked slowly under the ledge at about 90 yards. I didn't see the buck come out the other side of the rocks, so I was certain he bedded down. I then left my pack, inched my way down the ledge, never breaking a stick or rolling a rock, and closed the distance to just 20 yards. I peeked over the last rock where I'd seen him, and he was bedded down looking in the opposite direction. One quick neck shot completed the hunt. I began the three and a half mile drag at 1 p.m. He was on the wrong side of the mountain range to drag towards our vehicles. I drug him through the ledges, across the side hill, through three swamps, and up two small hills by myself. As my dad got his truck to bring to the other side of the mountain, Eventually, getting the buck to the truck five hours later, I've hunted this mountain range for 10 years, letting seven small bucks go, missing two, and finally harvesting a wall hanger, a hunt that I'll never forget. Oh, that sounds like a, you definitely got your, had your work cut out for you there, Brad, and, and got it done on a beautiful deer. So if anybody wants to go check out that buck, head over to East Meets West Hunt on Instagram uh, or East Meets West Outdoors on Facebook. You can see the photo of that deer as well as um, the story there too. So if you want to submit your own Mountain Buck Monday story, any successful Big Woods Mountain Buck hunt that you've had, you know, anywhere in the U.S., be able to send that in to Bo at EastMeetsWestHunt.com. Um, head over to the website. You can just hit the contact us form there and uh, be able to send in just a pair, short paragraph or two and a few photos. That would be awesome. Love to be able to share these stories with everybody. 
um, and other news. So I will be at Total Archery Challenge in Big Sky this week. So Big Sky, Montana, be out there working for Sitka again. Uh, so if you're in that area, I will be out there shooting. I really wish I was able to stay a little bit longer and do some scouting for elk as I'll be hunting Montana this year, but uh, it's going to be a quick in and out trip for me um, for that part. So uh, unfortunately, I won't get to, to get to do any scouting, but I've uh, been doing a lot of e-scouting for elk here especially in the last couple weeks even even more so just really diving into it building out the hunt plans trying to figure out what we're gonna do and and uh kind of the the method for that just just getting ready uh or been ordering some of my food ordered some heather's choice stuff here uh this morning actually and um and just did a podcast with heather uh last week so that'll be coming out but a lot of stuff coming down the pipeline a lot of podcasts a lot of videos a lot of a lot of everything so just getting ready for hunting season um i appreciate everybody listening and uh i hope you have a great rest of your week all right we're live chris b welcome to the show buddy live yeah we're uh, not really live but <laughs> <laughs> i always that's always kind of like the good the good intro we're not really live, but we're in a, a hotel here, Glenwood Springs, Colorado, nice. Total Archery Challenge. And yeah, this is the second time that I got to meet you. I got to meet you at Total Archery Challenge up in Michigan last year. Yep. And, but didn't really get to spend a whole lot of yeah, time. No. Around, yeah, no. Mm -hmm. It's cool. We're hanging out, sick of boys, running their tent, hanging out. Um, but yeah, man, it's good. It's good to finally like get to hang out a little bit, talk. Yeah, get to do some shooting. Uh, we on did the, on the course yesterday and today, which was yep. a lot of fun. I, I think we had a, a really good group, which like yes. for these types of events, like just having the right group together makes a difference. Yeah, groups kind of, you know, typically it's a good group of guys. You know, very efficient hitting stuff. Every now and again, you you get in a group that's like super slow, or you get behind a group that's super slow or something. Like some guys are saying today. Uh, the sicker ranger is like a huge backup midday mm -hmm. just like a couple big slow groups but yeah ours was good and it's great because we're like vendors technically and we can go up before everyone and we just trailblaze our way through and yeah and help fix the targets if so, yeah if, if the cattle mow them down lots but. of cattle <laughs> lots of cattle this time which was kind of weird but yeah this this venue is is super cool and scenic like mm -hmm. I've, I've only ever shot the the eastern total archery challenges in seven springs in michigan oh so this is like your first western one yeah oh yeah very nice so it's it's really cool yeah. getting to see this this area and, and getting a, you know shooting it you know above nine thousand feet on yeah. some of these courses and getting to do that was was pretty neat yeah i mean anything out west colorado one even the, the south dakota one's awesome um still like really technical mountainy type stuff Park City's dope. Never been to Big Sky. I really want to go to Big Sky, though. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, all these Western ones are sick. Yeah, and it, it was cool, too, like, <clears throat> you know, get, getting to shoot with all of you guys and kind of learning as you go. Like, one, obviously, with – actually, let's start with you going into a little bit of background on who you mm. are, and let's start with that, and then I'll, I'll lead into what I was going to say. Good. Um, yeah, so I have a, uh, a YouTube channel that's kind of like my main – my main hub of everything is just my name, Chris B. But I started in that. Um, well, I started bow hunting when I was 10. Uh, that's how I started in the archery and everything. My dad was a big bow hunter. Um, and he just introduced me into that in the backyard. You know, yeah. And I shot my first deer with the bow when I was 10. I've shot a deer with the bow every, every year since. Um, 10, 11, I shot a doe when I was 11. And a buck again when I was 12. When I was like 12 or 13, I started getting into competition stuff. Uh, so I had like a my hunting bow I just shot in, in competitions and whatnot and, and as I progressed in that I uh you know got a different bow got into more programs started traveling in, in the state a little bit um and then I I literally just worked programs I I shot with uh Joe Ad which is Junior Olympic Archery Development uh so it's like six years old to 18 um great program that USA Archery puts on a lot of clubs and everything all throughout the states um, do I also did NASP National Archery in the Schools program? Okay. So all throughout my my school careers, I I, I went through those, and that opened up a lot of doors. And um, but what for? I I don't mean to cut you off, but why? Yeah. Why did you start getting into those? Did 
did you or you know someone in your family like recognize that you were talented at this at a young age no. or was this just like so you were just so into it that you wanted to learn yeah. more and get I better really at it? liked it I really liked shooting in the backyard and uh, my dad uh, reached out and found this local club that put on a youth archery program mm -hmm. so he got me plugged in it was like three months in the winter time every Saturday morning you know we'd go shoot some arrows so it was I mean there's tons of kids there was like a hundred some kids in this program um, and it, it just kind of opened your eyes of like, you know, what's available and everything. So mm -hmm. I got plugged into that and I, I stuck with that, but yeah, it was, uh, that we reached out or my dad reached out to just find something. The NASP thing, uh, my high school had it. And by that point I was doing competitions and everything and they reached out and were like, you have to at least try this and shoot it. And at that point, I mean, we were doing competitions and we had rigs and, uh, I thought it was like a joke. Have you ever seen the NASP bow? Mm -hmm. No. It's like 20 pound max, uh, like solo cam looking Genesis bow. Okay. You ha you've you seen it. You probably just don't know the name. No, of it. I, I just, yeah, I yeah. guess I just don't know the name. It's just basic. So I thought I was going backwards, but that really opened up a lot of doors too. I mean, we, uh, our high school, uh, Heartland in Michigan now wins like nationals every year, which is wild. The progression it's I, I, luckily we got into a school just landed on it where it had an awesome program. Hundreds of kids. We had to turn, do tryouts, turn down kids, like huge varsity sport in, in my high school. Um, but yeah, we, for that, I made uh, a couple world teams. I went to South Africa shooting for that, uh, alongside like making some United States archery teams, um, in my youth. And then, uh, in that time I just started making videos like archery videos. And when I went into college, I kind of took one full year, to dedicate to making more videos, becoming a little more serious just to see if, if anything would stick, you know, yeah. a little bit more. And it did. I mean, it was great feedback. So I was like, all right, maybe we could do something out of this. So from there, luckily, you know, I, I, while I was in college, I just kept making videos. And then when I got out of college, I was able to just, that was my job, my career. So I just kind of coasted with it yeah how did you recognize at that point i mean how many years ago i guess was that when you first started making videos uh that was um five nine years ago ten years ago ten years ago and at that point i mean people were obviously doing youtube stuff but it was really kind of on the cusp before it like got to where it is today like yeah. how did you recognize like oh i can we had, I had a couple viral videos okay I, I had a couple videos that um, me and a couple friends, we did archery, archery stereotypes is what we did. I was like 16, 17. Uh, we were just like goofing off. I had this cheap camera and, and, uh, figured out editing. And I think on Facebook, it, it got close to like a million views. Like it went crazy. So that, that gave me like the, Oh, this is a thing. So then I made some other funny videos a long time ago. Um, and then started filming hunts alongside that. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, and at that point, I mean, w were you filming yourself like on these hunts? Yeah. Cause it's not like you're just like, Oh, I just got a camera guy now mm -hmm. and we're going to go through and do that. So ever since I was, I think 16, I have every single thing I've killed on film. Really? Mm -hmm. Just about maybe not some does, but yeah, I've been very dedicated to uh, solo filming. Um, and then, uh, and then when we were able to, you know, get some guys to help film, you yeah. know, ever since then. But yeah, I mean, even when I was 16, logging camera stuff up, I had a, you know, a handy cam similar to that one, but a lot cheaper, you yeah. know, just like rocking on a little, little camera arm. And yeah, man, I grinded it out in high school, just self filming, solo filming, and really learned how to do it all. And mm -hmm. yeah, I give you credit for that. As we talked about earlier, yeah, I, we said, did. <laughs> I said, I was like, every time I it's try tough, to do it, man. I'm just like, I can't, it's hard. You have to really, really want to yeah. do it. I still solo film. So like last year, uh, like all white tail season, I solo filmed. It's just, uh, it's kind of interesting storytelling and it's relatable, you know, because you're just like one-on-one. -on -one. It's not like production and, uh, yeah, it's more, it's almost more vlog style. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. but I mean your videos, you also have like, yeah, it's a little bit of that vlog style when you do the solo filming, but you also have like some really good B-roll and stuff that yeah. make it like a, it's a, a good mix, a, a good mixture there yeah. video. So it feels like that personal vibe. It's not like, yeah. you know, overly produced, but for sure at the same time has that quality to it. This year, I think most of the whitetail stuff will have a camera guy. Um, just cause we're going to make some more videos this year. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and just put some more work into it. But yeah, solo filming 
it's t- I've not killed a lot of deer because of solo filming. Even last year, it's just dumb. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> very frustrating. Yeah, very frustrating. Well, I, I, yeah, I I could imagine, and and you know, as you've progressed, and it's it's kind of interesting because. You know, anybody from the outside looking in, it's like, oh, okay, you know, yeah, Chris did this. He you know, had some viral videos and he, he mm-hmm. went through it. But it takes time. Like, you know, the fact that, you know, nine years ago you started doing this and you're building it. You know, mm-hmm. someone looks at your channel now or looks at your social media or stuff like, oh, yeah, he's, he's super successful at this. But it's taken time and dedication. I, like think it, of, I think it takes 10 years. Yeah. I think it takes really like 10 years of non Like, like we're very blessed that now – that like this year we're, we're getting things like figured out and um you know finally to a point where it, it is a job um and it, it's a full deal you know yeah. but it f- you know four years ago that was not the case you know we were still doing it for fun so yeah. you, you know you need to be in it for the right reasons you know and it, it takes 10 years to really do anything yeah if it takes less you bought stuff yeah <laughs> honestly dude like well, I, it, it's funny i remember the first time i came across your videos and i didn't come across on my own my cousin mason was like i was over his house and we go over and just have a couple beers cook mm-hmm. up food do man stuff you know we have yeah. man night we shoot bows shoot some bow. yeah, yeah shoot bows and like we do that on like wednesday nights after work and yeah and we went into his house and just threw some youtube videos on while we were mm-hmm. while we were bsing and and he's like oh you, you see this guy he's like this Chris B guy. I was like, no, I never, never saw him. And I, I feel like it was like maybe your caribou hunt. I don't know how mm. long ago you did that. Was that three years ago? Okay. So it wasn't really that long ago mm-hmm. that I came across, you know, your stuff. And, and I was like, man, that's, that's really cool. And then we started watching more, some of your spot and stock you yeah. know, videos and everything. And then just through the industry got to kind of know yeah. a lot of people that knew you and then eventually connected, but it was, it was pretty cool to, to be able to see that and then watch you even just in the last few mm-hmm. years, you know, grow and be able to do that. And now, like, you know, I met Riley that's here yep. with you, who's here filming you and, mm-hmm. and working for you. And yep. you have an office space now I heard yep. like that's, mm-hmm. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's just, it's uh, figuring stuff out and grinding and, you know, I, I mean, really anything just to make something, you know, make yeah. something where, I mean, really at the end of the day, just, it's just freedom. You know, the fact that we're here in Colorado, you know, shooting bow, yeah. it, you know, it's like, it's just, it's, it's, it's freedom, you know, and that's just entrepreneurship, any sector, yep. you know, like anything. It's like, yes, you can do nine to five, that's your jam, whatever, but. I don't know. I just like the freedom and flexibility to do, do whatever. And you yeah, know, luckily I like to shoot things and <laughs> it jives. Well, and, and, and I've talked about this on before when I did like a solo podcast talking about my journey to, you know, leaving my job and everything. Mm-hmm. And it's like, <laughs> no one really hunts for a living. Like, you know, you look at what you do and you're like seeing you do all these hunts. It's like, Oh, this is awesome. And it is like, that's, what's cool. mm -hmm. But people don't see the the behind the scenes stuff. And, you know, even, okay. Yeah. Today we're at total archery challenge and it's sweet. You shoot bows, hang out all these people, but you're Mm -hmm. working the whole time. You're filming, you're getting stuff, you're getting clips, you're doing that. Now started at six o'clock this morning. Mm -hmm. You're going through and then you're meeting with people and you're hanging out and you're shooting these types of things. And then this, and then even dinner, you know, we're we're going to eat dinner. We're going to talk business at dinner for sure. Yeah. And it's it's just like this constant. It's nonstop. It's nonstop, Mm -hmm. but you got to love it. And that's what's cool about it the nonstop part is what I'm working on right now. And that's partially why we got like an office space and stuff is to just start disconnecting a little bit, you know, where it's like you, you can go to the office and, and, and work on stuff, but then go home. Yeah. You know, and that's what, I, that's what I struggle with a little bit. Cause I'm nonstop and I've always been nonstop. Yeah. Um, so, so w- working on that balance is really <laughs> important. <laughs> I'm laughing just cause that's like, I feel like that's where I'm at too. And like, yeah. I, I remember like being like, all right, you know, once I leave my job, I'll have more time. I can like focus on stuff. And these are super important things to me that I've been not great with is like, you know, spend time with family and doing yeah. things and like disconnecting from, disconnecting, yeah. from doing that. And I struggle with it. It's I think, important. I think most entrepreneurs probably do or like, and, yeah. and, and I, after I left my job, I feel like I'm still just as busy as I was before because mm. I'm always like, oh, there's always stuff to do and mm. the difficulty of being able to, to separate. And I think, you know, going yeah. into an office and being able to come home yeah, that's should been, help with that. That's been good. You know, it's uh, my biggest thing is traveling. I've been traveling a lot. 
too much. I think next summer I'm going to have to tone it down. But it's just one thing after another, just boom, 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 boom. And we're back Sunday night, and then Tuesday morning we're gone again. You know, And then Monday after that we're gone again. And it's just like... One after another. Mm-hmm. It's tough. Yeah. Oh, for sure. And and what, what made you... Uh, to kind of transition a little bit here, but like mm-hmm. what made you like... All right, you're Michigan boy. Michigan has a strong mm-hmm. hunting culture, hunting there, wanting to like kind of expand and go to these different places to yep. be able to hunt. Like what made you do that and like how did you kind of figure that part out? Like Michigan? Like, like, no, like, like leaving Michigan and like oh, starting yeah, yeah. to expand. So I had, um, I had a buddy that kind of drug me out west for the first time and he kind of like showed me the way and uh, kind of opened my eyes. And that was like my first out of state hunt. Besides, uh, me and my dad went to Iowa for like my senior year. We like got points all through high school, and then mm-hmm. went out there senior. Year. That was like my first out of state. Um, we went to Texas once, um, but yeah, like opening up, just just seeing that hey, you could drive out of the state of Michigan, go buy over the counter tag somewhere else, and hunt and find public or knock on doors. Once I realized that, then I was like, oh, I can do whatever. I yeah. could go drive wherever and do whatever. Um, you know, obviously over the counter, you draw or, 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 you know, whatever, but you can figure it out, you know, and that's what's cool about it, just figuring it out. And yeah. Michigan does not have that big a deer. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, <laughs> yeah, they, it, they don't, and it's tough. So it's like getting out of that, you know, to experience something else was really cool. Yeah, and you knew what you wanted. You're like, I want an opportunity to be able to hunt bigger deer. Or, and, and somewhere hunt, else. And, and just whatever. go to different landscapes and places yep. and you know, I love I love watching your stuff and an area that I have not hunted and I want to is like some of your open country whitetail stuff. Some of that, mm. or and even mule deer too, spot and stock yeah. Nebraska and, and the Dakotas and Kansas mm. and all those places like that. It's seems, fun. Seems it's a uh, makes you well rounded. Yeah, you know, because you learn things out there and you can apply them in other situations. And it just makes, it makes you a well-rounded hunter. When you're constantly doing the same thing over and over again, you get kind of tunnel vision and you like are just doing the same things over and over again. You're, you're on the same piece of property, sitting in the same stands, doing the same thing. But then when you, when you get yourself outside of that bubble and you're like on a new piece and it's like flat or it's hilly or it's mountain and now you're dealing with thermals and everything else, it just makes you, it just makes you a better hunter, you know? Yeah. And it's like, you can read and you can do all this stuff and it's like, oh, I know it. But then you like then you're in it and it didn't work or it did work or this happened and that happened. But yeah, it is cool. It yeah. Is cool. No, it, I, I, I think that's awesome. People that go out and venture and try different things. And mm. it does, you know, I've learned so much from elk hunting that I can apply to whitetails and mm. like in other things, like there's, when you go to different places and put yourself in kind of almost like uncomfortable situations when mm. it's brand new to you, you can learn so much to apply yeah, I mean, in the, the same old things. I think that's just a life thing. You know, you yeah. put yourself in uncomfortable situations and you expand and you grow and it's no different than in hunting. Yeah. You know, I mean, that could even be like in state. Like I know in Michigan, if you go way south or way north, it's totally different. Yeah. You know, different bucks, different way of hunting, you know, probably PA, same thing, east to west. Yeah. Totally different north, north, south. And it's yeah. way different too. So it's like, I don't know, expand the horizons a little bit. Yep. No, it's, it's, it's funny in the last, I think it was in the last five years that in Pennsylvania alone, I've, I've killed bucks in four different counties and like, mm-hmm. I like going to different places Bouncing around and, and, yeah. and some of it will be like flatter big woods. Some might be more mountains. Some have, mm-hmm. you know, a little bit more swamp type stuff and just kind of right. like doing that. Even in your home state, you can yeah. find those opportunities and, and change it out. So when you know, as you've, uh, you know, hunted in these different places, what, what's your, what was your favorite place you went to, or what's the thing that like kind of keeps you like wanting to go forward with? Um, there's some States I don't like, but there's a lot that I do really like, really like Nebraska. Um, you know, I was really successful in Kansas, but Kansas is kind of tricky. You know, it's a very different way of hunting whitetails, mm-hmm. really patient, low deer density. You know, it's just different. Um, I like Nebraska. I like South Dakota. Um, Iowa's great, but Iowa is just another level in all aspects. Yeah. High competition for ground. It's a uh, big deer. Just, it's very different. Nothing I've ever experienced living there now for a year. Um, Michigan's always home. You know, I love hunting Michigan. Yeah. Um, what about Ohio. outside of whitetail? Um, I mean, mule deer, South Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska is dope. I've only hunted mule deer in Wyoming, South Dakota, Nebraska. 
So okay. I haven't really hunted a lot of states. And you've hunted, well, you hunt Alaska for caribou. Alaska for caribou, yep. Um, I've done Kansas, um, Illinois, Ohio, Michigan, Kentucky, Louisiana. Louisiana's cool. Louisiana is like uh, very different than anything I've ever experienced. I've hunted there a few times with a, um, a really good buddy, and uh, he invited me down one year, and they had a really cool operation. It's just diff- it di- the culture, everything is just totally different. A big hunt camp vibe, you know, it's like southern hospitality, just fun. Great so, food. Great food, <laughs> just, you know, like, 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 like good southern. And the giant deer, you can get in giant deer in Louisiana. Big bodies. I shot a buck that was 265 pounds. Mm -hmm. really just a magnum giant old like seven year old i think um but yeah big hunt camps down there you know well manicured and polished and you know they're hunting over you know bait stations and box blinds and it's just it's like texas of the south yeah really it really is yeah and i didn't realize that some of those southern states can grow big deer until really i was talking to um with Levi Morgan on the podcast before, and he's he talking about Mississippi. Yeah, and he was talking yeah. about the Mississippi, the River Delta, and yep. like some of the soil and some of the stuff. Why that grows? Like so, same thing. It, it's probably close in Louisiana, but yeah, the uh, makes the soil super fertile when mm-hmm. it floods and everything. So they grow big deer naturally, and then with all of these big hunt camps and everything, well managing, and you know they'll feed protein and and, and the whole nine. I mean, th- this one place I was going to, I mean they were shooting booners every year if not you know every other year it was wild real mm-hmm. it was wild uh, that's that's incredible and what when, when as you've all right so you're and you still shoot competitively now right yeah i do yep okay so f- you know if as far as like from a, a hunting standpoint how has competitive archery helped you from the hunting scenario like mm-hmm. obviously you're a better shot you know because you're shooting right. all the time but like diving into a little bit more like what are some things that you feel like from competitive archery that has helped you with the hunting scenario yeah so it just makes you more well-rounded you know it makes you more educated because target archery you really gotta you know dial in your setups and you're dealing with more equipment and different equipment and you shoot more you know you got to be more prepared the these some of these tournaments are high volume arrows you know we're shooting 72 arrows in a day um you know in a couple hours so it, you got to really pay attention um and yeah over the years you know just shooting thousands of arrows a year mm-hmm. just helps you become a better archer overall and then when you translate that into hunting you know now you're super technical on the target and and you have a uh, good form and you're you know lubed up and everything and then you go over to hunting and it's like easy yeah not not easy but it's way easier like you're just setting up a hunting bow and 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 getting everything dialed in tune i will say there's a lot of cool tuning things in uh hunting because of broadheads yeah you know now it opens up a whole nother thing on the target side of things really some guys don't tune their stuff or tune it way wacky or weird because it just groups better all we care about is groups in target Mm -hmm. so it's sometimes you don't have a perfect bullet hole to make it group the best it's really weird. Sometimes there's like some juju stuff going on, but <laughs> like, but but like, hunting bows you want perfect so yeah. that broadheads fly well, you know, twenty to a hundred yards or whatever. But yeah, if you slapped a broadhead on some of these target rigs, they'd probably go all over the place. Yeah, start whipping all over. Yeah, them. I mean, it's just different. It's a dif- it's a different way to go about it. Yeah, and and I'm sure too with like with shooting you know target archery and everything helps Mm. you with like keeping your mind right for it because Mm -hmm. you're under pressure you got people watching you you know you're you know you're you're fighting to win you know essentially Mm. and being under that pressure can help you like when there's a buck in front of you Mm -hmm. being able to keep your mind right you know we were talking earlier on the mountain about like you know buck fever yeah do you do you still experience oh yeah do you Mm -hmm. yeah and i think uh it's very, very similar, you know, like being in a shoot off or something is nerve wracking and it's like, it's micro nerve wracking because mm-hmm. you're trying to hit something so detailed and so small that you, you show that nervousness really, really easily. Um, we're, we're deer hunting, you know, you're trying to hit a pie plate so you can be nervous and still hit that pie plate, you know, like, yeah, no problem, you know, technically. Um, but yeah, very similar stress, um, nervousness, um, Yeah. It helps for sure because you're in your target target wise. If you do, if you do well, you're in a lot of shoot offs or even like, okay, I'm this last year. I'm going to shoot a perfect score. 
So it's like this little internal pressure that you're dealing with. Yeah. That's the biggest thing is the internal pressure on yourself. It's not external even. Mm-hmm. Like like your mind's just weird, dude. Like it's just it's just it gets you messed up. Yeah. Yeah, your mind can do, you're your own worst enemy in you all are. of those scenarios, you know, and mm. and I I just I feel like with learning how to deal with that you know, throughout the year, it's, mm-hmm. it's hard to mimic those scenarios, you know, for someone that's hunting and shooting in their backyard to mm-hmm. be able to mimic that, that pressure, yeah. you know, and, and be able to handle it. And I mean, if you're not in tournaments, the best way to do that is shooting a bunch of does or, you know, like just getting, literally getting your numbers up to do better under those situations. You know, it's like my girlfriend, Caitlin, she's like going through this like target panic stage. And like this year, she's just going to like wax a bunch of does. You know, just to get over it, like hogs, does, it's like, just build up that confidence again in, in getting through it. And through target archery, you, you you get that all the time, mm-hmm. you know, cause you're practicing, you're trying to get three hundreds or, or whatever. So you're constantly going over those little battles that help you, you know, but hunting's still very different. It's a, it's a different part of the mind. Yeah. You know, it's still there. It's not the same part. Yeah. No, that's it's not the same part. Yeah. And and I feel like, you know, people will look at, you know, someone like yourself or look at someone like Levi and just like, oh, it's automatically going to hit good. But you still, you still go oh, yeah. through those. You still get jacked. Yeah. You still get jacked up. You still got to pay attention. Yeah. Um, it never goes away. I don't know if it'll ever go away unless, you know, you just don't like it anymore. Yeah. Or you're just killing to kill. Yeah. At that point, you just hang the bow up. Right? Yeah. I mean, at that point, you're in it for the wrong reasons, I think. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I'll probably forever have that, hopefully. <laughs> hopefully. Trembling, right? yeah. I mean, gosh, dude. I mean, you know, I'm not perfect hunting either. I've messed up a lot. Yeah. You know, it's like that doesn't translate over to perfection by yeah. any means. But. It, so what do you see, like, all right, you know, we were talking, when we were shooting today um, on the course, we were mm-hmm. shooting some, like, long downhill shots, yep. and you were shooting a piece of video content for your YouTube channel, and you were talking about when – people are shooting downhill about mm-hmm. everyone talks about bending at the waist and that's like the first step, but you're t- also talking about like alignment with, yeah. with your elbow and everything. I mean, it's same tree stand hunting, long angles, whatever it, it's bending at the waist is the easiest way to say it, you know, just really quickly you bend at the waist and everything, everything lines up. But the biggest thing is that you want your shoulders aligned because if you have your shoulders out of the line, like if you keep your torso and your shoulders in the same spot and just move your arms, everything's going to be jacked. But if you move your shoulders, everything's still in line. So the simple way to say it is bend at the waist and then your shoulders go with your waist. Yeah. But as long as your shoulders are in line, you're going to have, you know, a similar anchor. Look through the peep sight. Really, the peep sight is a driver of the entire bow. You could be jacked. And as long as you look through your peep sight, center it up, center it up, and shoot, it's going to hit. Yeah. I was shooting with uh, Isaac in Oklahoma, and I was trying to explain that to him. And I'm like, listen, I drew back, and I just, like, didn't touch my face or anything and just looked through the peep, like, crooked like this and shot, and it went exactly the same spot. <laughs> that's, that's yeah, I mean, it makes it sense. Is, it, the peep sight is it. Yeah, and and it's easy to overcomplicate things, that's like, as you're. Overcomplicate. Yeah, as you're, mm-hmm. as you're thinking it. But, like. Yeah, it makes sense. And do you? It, and actually, we, I, that was I heard you say something else that I picked up on. And you were talking about like anchor points, mm-hmm. you know, like where you know kisser buttons, nose buttons, all those things. And yeah. You're like, well, none of that really matters when you start shooting different distances because mm-hmm. your your anchor point changes. Your anchor point changes. Mm-hmm. You know, like a nose but a nose button is like the thing right now. And it's like if you're shooting a fixed pin, um, it's fine. Like if if you if you line up your housing with the peep sight. And then just run it and you move up and down and set the pins. That's fine. Some guys align their peep sight with every individual pin. So their housing might not be perfectly aligned. Mm-hmm. That's technically the most most accurate way to shoot a fixed pin is, you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. like you have all of your pins and you line up each one with your peep sight. So you're, you're moving your anchor a little bit. You know, it's like, and then a, a slider sight. I mean, unless you just like something pokey to touch, like it's just not. It's just, it doesn't do anything because you go to 20 yards and you're, you're high, you know, you yep. had a high anchor and then you go to a hundred yards and you got a low anchor Well, you you just moved all, you just moved everything. Yeah. You know, an anchor is just a reference point on your face to touch. That's all it is. It's to be more steady. It's to be more accurate, but unless you're shooting a static distance, you don't have the same anchor point every time. 
You just don't. And I, I've noticed that, like, I always struggle with when I'm setting up a new bow mm-hmm. of where I put my peep sight. Because, yeah. like, you know, first of all, when you're setting it in, like, you, you don't have your bow sighted in at that point, right, obviously. Right. And you're, like, trying to figure out where's the best place to have it so it fits good, you yep. know, safe, like, for me when I'm shooting a uh, thumb button, like, where I'm able to put it right on the crease of my chin yep. and have it at, like, say, for me, it's, like, I want to have it perfect for, like, 30 yards. Of, like, that's where my mm-hmm. normal, you know, shooting it up and down, I can kind of move it and it's not going to change a whole lot. But, you know, if you sight that in for say like 20 yards and that and you're all focused on that anchor point well you start shooting at 60 yards you're gonna be down you're gonna be way well, yeah so this is a this is a target example is like we learn all this in target archery if we're shooting you know a field course or something that's uh four yards to 80 yards you want everything to feel perfect at 45 so that way you, your median distance you want everything to feel perfect that way, you know, when you're close, you're a little high. When, when you're far, you're a little low. Yeah. But you're still in that median. So, I mean, to set your peep sight like that, the best way to do it is with your eyes closed. You draw back with your eyes closed, get all anchor. How's it feel? And then you open your eyes and you're like, oh, my peep sight's an inch low. You know, the worst yeah. way to do it is, is to fight it. Um, but Yeah, and try, and try to make it. Try to make it something. It's like whatever feels the best with your eyes closed, typically you just move the peep sight there and, and you're good and that's your me- that should be your median distance. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We, I, I remember when we'd set people up at the archery shop, that's what we'd do. We'd mm-hmm. go and we'd have them draw back, close their eyes, yep. you know, put their nose on you know, wherever their anchor is and just open it up and look. And then I'd take a, I'd take a permanent marker oh, and good. go down and see where they'd line up and where it felt like. I'm like, don't move your head, don't move anything, just <laughs> yeah. like – let me move the marker and then I'll, you know, make Perfect. the mark there. Did you work at a pro shop? Yeah. Oh, good. I yeah. didn't know that. Yeah, I did. Sweet. So that's right. That's yeah. Kind of how I started with like even getting into the, you know, the quote unquote hunting industry was right. like, I, I started working at a pro shop on the side Sweet. and got to meet a lot of people. So when I started what my pro shop, uh, bucks and bows archery in, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Okay. So I lived down cool. there for a while and so I, I worked there and got to learn a lot of that yeah. stuff. I was, I was never like proficient on i wasn't like their head bow tuner or anything but i'd Mm -hmm. I'd set up bows i you know work with people on things and for sure and teaching a little bit of that so that's that's kind of where i learned it's a great you it's great to know what's going on it is bow hunting and And, like if something breaks on the fly or or whatever and now i have like in my basement i have a little shop set up so i work on all my own bows i can go in there and and tune them decently and kind of figure it out i still i still get on youtube and watch how to do different things and just once you understand the basic concepts the information's out there to be able to, to yeah, help I mean, you with it i still refresh myself on like how do i do this not again or, or yeah. whatever you know it's like i, I you know we're, we're constantly i'm constantly learning too like yeah. it's a never-ending thing i sw- i swear because i mean now i'm just setting up my own bows like i, I don't do it all the time so mm-hmm. like even things like tying in a peep like i'll like wait a second <laughs> how many times did i go well, around it's different this? when you work in a pro shop you do dozens a week yeah but it, it's like even me i only set up maybe you know 10 ish bows a year buddies and whatever but i'm constantly tinkering and changing and, and cutting things up but start to finish bow setups it's only like 10 a year yeah you know? and i will say like if you find a good pro shop and that's like what makes you use those people like that's what mm-hmm. they're there for to do like i don't even live anywhere near a pro shop like i mm-hmm. live i think the nearest pro shop's an hour and 15 minutes from mm-hmm. me so like it was kind of a necessity right. to, to figure it continue out continue to, to do that and it's but if you do find a good pro shop, that, that can be a very beneficial tool because they know how to do yeah. that. But if you like tinkering with things, like I yeah. like doing it, and it's, it's fun to have my own little setup in the basement. And I mean, most pro shops do a good job, but they are, they are you know, let's get this done and get it out the door. You know, it's like mm-hmm. some are great about spending time with you and, and getting things tuned. But, every, you know, sometimes it's just like set up the bow and do, do, do. So it is good to, you know, like then do some extra steps of tuning or, or whatever after that really simple stuff, you know, like broadhead tuning, just loosening and moving the rest, yeah. you know, it's great to learn and figure out. Um, but yeah, there's always something you can do no matter your situation you can do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I, I have an, uh, interesting question for you. So like when you're shooting, yep. um, you know, you, you get your hunting rig set up and you're shooting your bow, how do you go from, all right, you get everything tuned, you go to shoot, but okay, your broadheads are hitting a little bit different. Like what, or what's your process for, uh, shooting your broadheads, like in mm-hmm. broadhead tuning, how's your process look? Yeah. It seems like it's different every single time, but, uh, just cause some, something's different, new bow, whatever. And you get a new bow every year and you got to figure it all out again. Yeah. But it's like, 
so you start with just like a, a basic paper tune. Like that's just kind of like your neutral starting point. For me, it's like a Matthews is set up at 13 18 from center of the arrow to the shelf. I shoot like the QAD, so I, I just zero it all in and, and then shoot it through paper. It'll be close. And then you go out. You And what I do is I shoot like at 20 yards, field tip broadhead, and then go to like 80 field tip broadhead. And if they're off, it's like, okay, I got to figure something out. Yeah. Last year, literally all it was was my veins didn't steer my broadhead enough. So I did like three or four different vein configurations. I was running like heat veins, just a three-fletch heat. Yeah. And on a fixed blade, that just was not enough for me. It was, it was starting to a plane. very low-profile vein. Yeah, it was yeah. starting to plane and do, and do some different stuff. And so, I, you know, I made some different configurations, and I tightened it right up. Last year, I spent a lot of time because I went elk hunting for the first time, or second time, but... Anyways, it was a it was a big hunt, so I really paid attention. Wanted to shoot fixed blades because I shoot expandables a lot. Mm-hmm. So I spent some extra time, and I mean, by the end of it, I got a right right configuration and twenty yards. I shot one arrow at twenty and one arrow at ninety, and they were like that. Yeah. So I was like, I'm good. So you just you're just moving your rest a little bit and trying you to move the rest. Yeah, yeah. So it's in. like if 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 it is off, you shoot a field tip and a broadhead. You move the broadhead to the field tip. Yep. So you're moving the rest in the way that you want it to go. You move it towards the field. Tip. Towards the field. Tip. Yep. Yep. You can get down a wormhole really easily yeah, with that. And I'm, like, not, and I'm not trying to. <laughs> no, 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 no. Well, I'm saying like, like you could, you could move it way too. Like you're like, oh, you, you, you move too much, and then you're back, and, you, and then you end up your way off, and you got to restart. So it's like a very small <laughs> micro stuff is really good, and it's like the problem is, is it could be so many things. You know, it's not just one thing. It's like your spine of your arrow could be wrong. Your fletchings could be bad. Your broadhead might be bad for your setup. Like it, it's, you could have face uh, contact. You could be torquing the bow. There's just like a plethora of things. So it's not like one thing. That's why you just got to start at neutral and then wherever it goes, you just kind of figure it out. Oh, man. I feel like I go down so many, like, personally, my own rabbit holes of, like, and then if something's not working, I'm like, what am I doing? And I'm like, then you overthink it, and sometimes you just got to step away for a day. Broadheads are frustrating. And come back to it Mm -hmm. and then just, like, try to, you know, figure that out all again. But Broadheads and sight tapes. Yeah. Oh, (laughs) I hate trying to put sight tapes Mm -hmm. on because actually the one I did here for TAC because I was waiting on a sight to come in and I'm like, no, I just got to get this bow set up so I can do it. And this was the quickest I did a sight tape. Normally it takes me like two weeks to feel like I'm like good and good. Like, and I feel good. This one, I just kind (laughs) of, I I knew my bow was shooting similar speed as it was before. and I was just swapping sights. So I like, I I was shooting one sight tape and I'm like, all right, this bow is a little bit faster and my arrow set up. So like, then I like took the next tape and i'm like i'm like ah this is about right and i kind of like i I did it out to 60 and i'm like all right that'll that'll be good enough for me to go and it you're cool you're you're, you're good right maybe a yard off today or something yeah that was the altitude yeah (laughs) that's That's a whole nother wormhole i don't (laughs) know how i feel about that i (laughs) have my own speculations if that matters or not (laughs) yeah i don't know but and and (laughs) before uh, just going back to something you said about like the micro adjustments to your rest, you know, we were doing that with my site today. I was hitting left mm-hmm. on, on some, it was consistently hitting left on some of these yeah. targets and, you know, you were, you know, adjusting my windage adjustments mm-hmm. and as we were, you know, cranking it and you're like each a little click, it sounds like horrible, like, mm-hmm. especially on that spot hog. It was like, spot hogs are very robust. Yeah. And it was like clicking and you're like, it's not really making that much of a difference. Most. When you're yeah. clicking most it. sites are like one click at 20 yards is an eighth inch yeah so, so it's like to do anything major you gotta like yeah you gotta whack them. so yeah, yeah we, we got that kind of tuned in but i did yeah found out at longer distances i was off by about two yards mm-hmm. and then once i got that kind of figured out then it was it, i felt better with it i guess yeah yeah i was a little high too but i put my shape to sight tape together in like an hour <laughs> did you really? so i was i was very happy with how close it was <laughs> yeah no, I, I like changed. I like changed everything right before this. New arrows, new sight tape, and yeah. I'm always messing with stuff. Yeah, it's it's fun. It's it, it is. Yeah, it can no, be it frustrating. It's a hobby, really. I mean, yeah. like messing with stuff, tinkering on bows. I mean, it's it's a whole it's a whole deal. Yeah, like this year, I got four different arrow setups that I'm mm-hmm. playing with, and just kind of in different vein configurations. I've shot four Fletch for the last four or five years, and I just went to a, a, a three Fletch. From a recommendation, actually, of uh, Bill of Iron Will was like, mm-hmm. "Hey, I, I think with you know this arrow setup that 
from what I've tested, like these will fly best with a my broadheads. Yeah, hmm. and and so I've been trying those out, and nice. I haven't I haven't shot them with the broadheads yet. To I, I literally have those arrows. They <laughs> just got them set up like a day before, you know, the yeah, 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 yeah. challenge. But like, I, I I like messing with that, and I have some different diameter arrows, and different components, mm-hmm. and it's just it's it's good to tinker. I yeah, mean, it makes you makes you better makes you more knowledgeable um you know like that's my big thing like right now i've been testing arrows so it's like i've been testing like gold tip and victory and easton and i even have like some serious ones and i just i like went all out shot shot a bunch and and, uh just you know figure out what i like what i like best Mm -hmm. you know it's if i'm gonna my thing is like if i'm gonna say it i at least did my due diligence and my homework to to believe in it yeah and what what's your thought on like how do you balance like arrow, like total arrow weight and everything? Mm. You know, that's like a topic that FOC is a topic right now. Yeah. I think it's like one of those things that is not as important as others. It is like the last thing on the list you should worry about. You should worry about shooting well, practicing like broadhead tuning, a lot of other things before you worry about and calculating your FOC of an arrow. The, the amount that it actually matters in the grand scheme of things of shooting a deer double lung is negligible i mean like i like to run an arrow like 450 480 grains and anything in north america that is totally fine with regardless if it's you know at regardless of the foc that grain arrow will shoot anything in north america pretty much yeah no that that makes sense my my arrow setups actually right now the ones i'm shooting are 462 and yeah, I mean, like solid. so my range i found is 460 to 480 i'm only a 27 and a half inch draw mm-hmm. i like to have something that's in the middle of not having giant pin gap because right. i've shot them up to 540 you know yes. bigger ones and i, was I have like, two yeah. and there's just like a lot of drop and just that was right. for me i looked at it like okay if i'm not gonna even hit this deer like yeah. what is the pros the and point? cons yeah there's pros and cons and everything like yeah you have a heavy arrow 650 grains you're not going to want to shoot farther than 30 yards. Yeah. It's just going to be like nothing. And, it, you know, it's, it's just what's more important to you. Really. Yeah. And that's, it's that's personal the same preference. thing. Like when you can go back and forth, broadheads, all those different things. Like mm. when I, I did a podcast where I was talking to, I had Levi on this big mechanical guy mm-hmm. and I had Garrett Prawls, big fixed blade guy and a couple others and all just talked about it. And like, mm-hmm. you could listen to everybody and come up with, Oh, yeah, you know, that's they're all that, valid. You know, they're all valid points, yeah. and it's all they all have their cons and nothing, they all have their pros. Nothing is right, and yeah. that, that there are some wrongs for <laughs> sure, but nothing's right. Yeah, you know, and uh, and I think that's what's great about it, you know, and, and the tinkering aspect, and 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 why archery is cool and bow hunting is cool. You know, it's like you could kill a deer with a field tip if you wanted to. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> if you wanted to, you know, what I mean, but it's it's not ethical, but <laughs> yeah. it would kill it. You yeah. know. So uh, expandables, fixed blades. I mean, it's that's a big rabbit hole. I think something that you're confident in um, is is way more important. When something it's confident, you know, it's going to hit right on. Is more important than it being a fixed blade or a mechanical. Yeah. If I had a giant five inch mechanical and I hit a deer double lung, it's going to die. If I know, my, like I'm practiced, everything else is perfect. If I had a giant mechanical, you know, it's going to die. If you hit a, you know, a G5 Montec or a Rage in a shoulder bone. None of them are going to kill it, you know, yeah. unless you have a 700 grain arrow at 10 yards, yeah. you know, going through a big buck's main shoulder bone. I don't know. Yeah. No, there's, there's a lot of things. And one thing I also say is, is, you know, we just talked a lot about tinkering and changing all these things. There's also mm-hmm. something to be said about having a bow that you just are confident in yeah. and you can shoot every year and you just like know that set up really well mm-hmm. and you have that confidence in it. You know, when I hunted, when I went on a trip for Sitka in 2018 up to Jim Hole's place in Alberta, mm-hmm. he would always, his whole thing was, I could tell who the best hunters are when they came with a, a worn bow that was like, you know, that they just worn they were, down yeah, worn yeah. down and confident and using it. Yeah. And, you know, versus someone that shows up with a brand new setup that they don't really know well. It's different right. for, you know, you know, people like myself and you that tinker with it and learn, you know, these setups, even though they might right. be new to us a couple months ago, we spent all this time in it. Right. But if you're someone that doesn't have that, it's like, yeah. uh, it, it can be. I mean, if I wasn't forced to shoot a new bow every year, I would definitely like spend two years with a bow. Mm-hmm. I think two years with a bow is good. 
Um, you know, I had a lot of good bows, um, like a Hoyt Helix. I love that bow. My VXR 31 and a half. I love that bow and I never even hunted with it. Um, just the way it, the timing with new bows and everything worked out. So it's like, sometimes you just land, like my bow now is I've, I just told a guy I chose to shoot at tack instead of, I have a TRX 34, which is more of a target rig that I set up last year. But my, my current bow has been shooting great. So I'm mm-hmm. like, I'm just shooting this one because it's great. But every now and again, you just land on a really good bow. Yeah. Um, I don't know what it, you know, what it is. And it, I even have two V3Xs and I set them up exactly the same and one shoots better than the other. It's like, why? Why, yeah. why does one, why do you feel like one shoot better than the other? I don't know. Maybe I tinkered on that one more or whatnot, but bows are temperamental. I mean, they're, they're a yeah. changing system. And everyone's got their preference. It's yeah. like, you know, a lot of, you know, there's a ton of manufacturers out there and a lot of them are making really good bows. It's mm-hmm. just what feels, yeah. feels good, you know, for Again, you. Again, there's no, there's no right answer. Yep. Mm-hmm. I, I, there's some that I for sure would not shoot, yeah. <laughs> but there's a lot, you know, I mean, any, yeah. any top of the line brand is making a great product. It's yeah, just, it's just personal preference. What we would when I worked at the pro shop, the way I was taught there was like when a customer would come in, you know, at, you you can only ask them politely so many times to try to shoot all the bows. Like, right. shoot, set well, let me set you up. You know, uh, so mm-hmm. Matthews a prime, you know, Hoy a mm-hmm. PSC. Like, let's shoot them and see what feels good for you. Like, take your mm-hmm. take your brand loyalty or right. think that you want out of the the window and just and shoot them and see right. and see what you think and and how you like it and mm-hmm. and and because and, and then there's some people that come in and it's like oh i, I, want, I want the new yeah, yeah. i want i want the mm. new prime i want the new matthews i want this and that's just I'm like okay yeah, all right yeah. that's what you want which is which is also fine yeah you know there's nothing wrong with that but yeah to, i don't know ted yeah just to truly feel it it's like sometimes you just gotta you gotta shoot them and and understand it but i yeah i that's just something that I, I remember being in an archery shop and, mm-hmm. and, and that's how I landed on, you know, for me, when I, I started shooting prime, I was mm-hmm. like, I could shoot any bow in that shop. And for me, it felt really good. Mm-hmm. And I liked the solid back wall. And yep. that was just something that felt really good for me. It felt really well balanced yep. and I just liked it. And that's mm-hmm. why I, you know, started shooting it and everyone's again, has those preferences yeah. and be able to use it. You know, prime with their solid back wall. I mean, other bow companies do not have that. And yeah. that is one thing. If that's what you like, then that's your deal. Yeah. You know, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Yep. I think there's a lot of stigmas in like this extreme brand loyalty that this sucks. And this is, well, it's like, okay, well, <laughs> you could pick up any bow and kill anything, or you could pick up any bow and shoot really well still, yeah. you know? So it's, it's all personal preference. Yeah, I definitely. Think. No, it's, it's cool. Same thing with, yeah, any type of gear you can look at. And, you know, you and I were talking about beforehand, um, you know, as now we both, you know, are, you know, technically sponsored by Sika gear, but mm-hmm. we both wore it well before that. I oh, just yeah. liked it mm-hmm. and, you know, had opportunities to do I different had, things. I have bought a lot of Sika yeah. on my own, you know, just, just wanting to wear it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and getting and feel confident in it, you know, when you yeah. go in, how your system's going to work and how you're going to feel it. Mm-hmm. And it's just, it's, uh, it's really cool. Mm-hmm. And, and just the people are great, uh, within yeah. the company and getting, Getting to be able to do events like this and, mm-hmm. and hang out with everybody was cool. We did the happy hour tonight. Happy hour was good. It was good. Had two kegs of beer. Gone two. in like 30 minutes, if that. Yeah, people like coming for free beer. <laughs> yeah, it didn't take much. <laughs> no. It didn't take much. No, yeah. it, was, it, was a, it was a good time, man. Yeah. For sure. But, well, Chris, I think we should go get some dinner. Yeah. I, mean, um, I think it's... 8, 10, yeah. Yeah, we should go get some dinner, but... Let thank you for coming on. Yeah, man. And I, I, we were trying to do this all day and just kind of everything kept getting, uh, you know, messed up. So we did it in the hotel room here, but yeah. thank you for coming on. Let everybody know where they can follow along, see your stuff, check it out. And, uh, we'll, I'm, I'm sure we'll be doing more of these in the future. Yeah. Thanks man. Yeah. You can check me out. Just Chris B B E just like the bumblebee. Yeah. Gotta say be, it every time. Be real. Be real. Yep, yep. Yep. Thanks man. Yeah. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks buddy. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of East Meets West Hunt with your host, Bo Martonic. For more great content and to stay up to date, visit eastmeetswesthunt.com, Facebook at East Meets West Outdoors, and Instagram at East Meets West Hunt. If you enjoyed today's episode, please review and subscribe, and we'll catch you next time.